Welcome to a, another week of these teachings on being narrowly focused. Uh, the, the term the Holy Spirit used is laser focused on revival. Again, I'm going to say, uh, now I don't know what year you might be watching this video. It might be 10 years from now. And listen, the truth doesn't change. Truth is truth. It'll be the same 10 years from now. But we're in the early part of the year 2024. And this is a very important year, uh, not just because we're having elections here in America, but uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, it's a very important year, and I can't really get off into that today. But I'm not surprised that the Holy Spirit right now, he had me leave the agenda that he had me on. He had me reteaching those articles from the website. I had finished, I mean, those articles have been there like 20 years, and we added a few lessons that weren't there before, and uh, <clears throat> he said he wanted them done in a modern format. So we're, I was doing that, and we finished the first two uh, sections and about to start the third one. And he just changed the direction right at the beginning of the year. He says, no. Uh, <laughs> and he, had to, he confirmed what he was saying to me through a prophecy through Pastor Brock Flint down in Immokalee, Florida. <laughs> Remember that Thursday morning I was seeking the Lord, and and I could sense this change of direction, but I just wasn't quite sure. And he said, <laughs> the Holy Spirit just said, I spoke a word through Bronk last night that you need to hear. <laughs> well, that's a Wednesday night service, and, and normally I would, I would have been watching that on YouTube anyway, but the circumstances prevented it. So thank God for YouTube. I, I, mean, I Went right in there and started YouTube, and I watched, and sure enough, it, uh, there was a really strong prophecy, and it was so, see, it it was so perfect. It was exactly what I needed to hear. It lined up. See, that's what prophecy is. It, it, uh, it's a, very often, it's a confirmation uh, and, and a fine-tuning of what you were hearing already, and that's exactly the way it was. Well, we've already talked about that, but the Lord is wanting us to uh, laser focus this year on the revival. You know, you know, the body of Christ, Alan Taylor teaches on this quite often about, you know, there, there's really only one body of Christ and we each have a part to play in that body. You know, uh, <clears throat> you know, I only have one heart. My heart is always a heart. <laughs> it's not going to change into something else. It has a calling. It has a purpose to pump the blood through my body and along with other things. But the point is, my heart has a purpose. My lungs have a purpose. That purpose is not going to change. Um, every part of our body, my eyes have a purpose. And none of the parts can say to the other parts, I have no need of thee. Well, see, there's many parts in the body of Christ. And God's calling uh, <laughs> uh, in, in this most pivotal year of 2024, I'm, he's calling some to really focus on certain areas. That's their part. It's what he's called them to do. But see, if you're listening to this message, you're probably a longtime listener to Dave Roberson and Bronk Flint, Jim Martin, Alan Taylor, and Hans Zonstra and Doug Zonstra and others. And, and you're what we call a revivalist. And you know what our assignment is. Dave would say it over and over again, many times through the years. You know, so it's, it's a it's a very clear vision when you can state your vision in a single sentence. And God told Dave, He says, "I want you to take a group of people far enough into God, far enough into Me," is the way the Lord said it, that they can bring a supernatural revival to a religious city that will spread to the nation and around the world. That is our purpose: a supernatural revival. Other times you might call it an outpouring. But what he's really talking about in plain old Oklahoma terms for Gary, he's talking about Jesus meetings again in the earth, see? And I thank God for any meetings that we're having, uh, where anybody's having. That's where Jesus is preached, Christ and him crucified, and where the, the, the gifts of the Spirit are in manifestation and people get healed and, and, and repentance takes place. And, uh, you know, the the... The gifts of the Spirit are in manifesta manifestation. Well, thank God. But see, that's still not Jesus' meetings. <laughs> and I've taught this many times. I'm not going to teach it again today. But 
See, at a Jesus meeting, if you went to a Jesus meeting, and I'm talking about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where he, he got to do them himself. Uh, and what I mean is through, <laughs> through his own body. He's still doing it himself. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, where, where he had his own physical body. He healed them all. Remember that message I do every now and then? where we go through the, just stay in the book of Matthew so we're not, you know, we're not duplicating the same message again. But just stay in the book of Matthew. And now I'm up to seven. I got seven different times, seven different meetings where it plainly says, and wording a little different, but the end result is he healed them all. And it didn't matter what you came with. You can come missing a leg. <laughs> And I mean, during the service with people watching, you're going to, you're going to wind up with, they're going to watch a leg grow up. I mean, he healed them all. We're not, we're not, and we're not seeing that right now. Somebody asked me he just yesterday, a friend of mine, a great man of God. And he, he, I've shared a few things with him where my meditator is right now. And while I'm meditating one, he asked me, he says, well, how are you coming on that? And I said, well, the best way to answer is this. I'm still meditating. But my friend Homer, which is associate pastor of Pastor Bronk Flint down in Immokalee, my, my friend Homer is still blind. What does that tell you? Well, we're not in the Jesus meetings yet. <laughs> not yet. Uh, and I, Don't get me wrong. I thank God again for any meetings we have in his name where people get saved, healed, delivered, devils cast out. Thank God for all of that. But it's still not the mark the standard that he left us. Again, what did he say? The works that I do shall you do also, and even greater than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. He did not allow us the privilege of lowering the mark, <laughs> lowering the standard. He said, no, the works that I do, same mark. <laughs> You know, Paul talks about pressing toward the mark, not lowering the mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's press toward the mark. Okay. So, this year, 2024, he's really having us narrowly focus again. Yes, sir. I see the image again. So, I'm just going to do it. We're going to do a little review, I guess. Here in these meetings, since the turn of the year, he's not even letting me prepare a lesson ahead of time, really. Now, I mean, he might in the future, but so far he hadn't. What is laser focus? Again, here, here we are. Laser focus. This is a laser. It's a little, somebody gave me a mouse laser. laser. Cast a beam like that. Now, if you're going to narrowly focus, does that mean you're off looking like this? Oh, there's calamity off to my left. I hear crashing <laughs> sounds. Wait a minute. What's that over on the right? People are, they want my attention. They, I need to go over there. Is that laser focus? Or is this laser focus? Or you, I mean, can you imagine? I'm just going to focus right there. How long? For a year. <laughs> Till revival comes. That's, that's my focus. Yeah, but can't you hear the calamity to your left? I can hear it. But I'm not going to divert to it. Yeah, but what about, what about all that noise? You, what about all that on the right? No. Uh, I, I may have to handle a few things, but my focus, my focus is on revival. That's what I've been called to. A supernatural outpouring that's going to change the world. See, I don't, I'm not a prophet. He's never called me a prophet. Uh, I have, but I have the spirit of truth on the inside of me. I do know that there's going to be a great harvest according to scripture, not only uh, his, what we call present hour speaking or prophecy today, but you can just look at scripture where he talks about the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. The glory of the latter house will exceed the glory of the former house. Uh, he's going to give us the, the, uh, the early rain and the latter rain are going to come at the same time. There's so many verses, so many scriptures that promise a great harvest. Now, I don't know really, since I'm not a prophet, <laughs> I don't know how that revival is going to happen. You've got to understand. See, we love reading the book of Acts, don't we? Oh, man, the things that happened. Hallelujah. You know, all kinds of 
you know, <laughs> signs and wonders and power and healings and miracles by the hands of the apostles. And wow, wouldn't it have been great to live in that first, you know, the book of Acts revival. And we tend to forget <laughs> they were a conquered land. The government was Rome where you, they demanded that you bow down and worship Caesar as a god? Come on. Gross darkness. It was not pleasant. The persecution, not only by Rome, but also by the Jews. Now, we, I love the Jews. Uh, pray for Israel. Pray for everything that they're going through right now. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. We better be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. But still, in that first century where we we so want revival, you know, and we, man, it's going to be greater than the book of Acts. Well, the book of Acts happened under extreme persecution, not only from the Roman government, but also from the, the, the legalistic Jews. Let me say it that way. Those who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And you can read about it in Hebrews. It says they confiscated your goods. They made, made you a laughing stock, a mockery among the people. If you read the history books... They were uh, um, not allowed to attend university if you were a, Christ a Jewish Christian. They would uh, shun your business. The idea they're going to bankrupt you, you know. It was gross darkness, but revival raged. The way things are going in this country, if things don't turn around this year, then our revival is going to happen under a, a, under a blanket of gross darkness. And... Uh, you know, eventually this globalism thing is going to happen. You can just read about it in the in the Bible. I mean, when it starts talking about the one world government, you can't buy or sell without taking the mark of the beast, either in your forehead or in your hand. And you can already see that coming. They're talking about these different kind of chips and things that they you won't, you know, in a digital currency. I mean, there's so many things that are lining up with, with the Bible. How people can read the Bible and not know it's true. You know, I mean... All these hundreds, thousands of years ago, the predictions that are made, and they're still coming to pass, and every everything's going to come to pass. Anyway, we got to get to to today's lesson. Beginning of the year again. I'm not going to belabor this today because we want to move on to a new portion. But again, I heard right at the beginning of the year, Gary talking to me, "Humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself." And when you don't think you can humble yourself anymore, then humble yourself some more. But this year, I heard, he gave me seven categories here, I guess you could call them, seven ways, seven things I could focus on. Seven. Th See, I like it when I get, you know, again, Gary, you need to walk in more faith. Thank you. I think I knew that before I heard your hour-long message. You know, I know I need to walk in more faith. Can you tell me how? Gary, you need to walk in more love. That's your problem. You need to walk in more love. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I knew that before I came and gave my offering into your message. <laughs> can anyone tell me how? Thank God for Pastor Dave telling us how you can do those things. But see, now, humble yourself. Okay. Can you tell me how? This year, thank God, he 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 went into more detail as to seven different ways, seven things that we can do on purpose if you really want to humble yourself. So let me just list them again. I might talk a little bit, just in a way of review, I hope. So he said, humble your, okay, number one, humble yourself by believing the word. Uh, we're all working there, aren't we? I want to have the attitude of Mary. Be it unto me according to thy word. That's the right attitude to have. Not like Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who said, I don't know how this could happen. <laughs> that sounds impossible to me. So the angel had to shut his mouth. Uh, the angel may have to shut a lot of our mouths <laughs> before we get into revival. But anyway, but humble yourself by believing the word. We've already talked about that some this, this season. Humble yourself through fasting. Now, we're in the first quarter of the year, and Dave would lovingly but relentlessly teach on fasting in the first quarter. The last lesson we taught on fasting, son, I want to remind you again about Elijah's cave. Remember when he was trying to, he really needed to hear from the Lord. Uh, religion was out to kill him. Jezebel had already threatened him. I'm going to kill you. 
So he went to this cave to hear the Lord, but at first it was uh, an earthquake and, and a fire and wind and the rocks broke and everything, but it says the Lord wasn't in those things. See, after all that stopped, there came a great calm. Then, then he heard that still small voice of the Lord and he got precise instruction what to do. Boy, that's what we need, see. Humble yourself through fasting. The reason I mention that, fasting during the first three or four days is a lot like the caves. My body doesn't like it. There's, it's earthquake, fire, wind. <laughs> My body, give me a hamburger. I will kill you. <laughs> it's, ah, I don't like those first three or four days, you know. But once your body switches over to ketosis, and I talked about that last week, where it's now it's eating. See, your body, it, it, it'll switch what it's eating from. It's not eating the external food that you put in it anymore. Now it's it's eating the fat reserves in your body, but it's eating. And it, there's a great calm. That I love it. I don't like getting there. <laughs> I don't like the, the earthquake and the fire and the wind and, you know, my, my body. I don't like the early part of fasting. But, boy, I like that after the fourth day for me. It's usually the fourth day. That quietness. No wonder Dave says, we don't fast so our voice is heard on a high. We fast so we hear his voice on low. And that... Oh, anyway, I, I, I've already we've already talked about that. Don't want to take up the whole time on that. But if you're not fasting, I should have brought my calendar in, not to show you what I'm doing, but just it's just a simple calendar I have about the size of a sheet of paper, you know, just one of those simple calendars, and and uh, where you can schedule your fasting. Think about it ahead of time. What what days, what weeks, or you know, am I going to fast? And I again, I'll, I'll refer you back to the scripture that we quoted last week where Jesus said, when the bridegroom is taken away, in other words, when Jesus is not on planet Earth, which is now, <laughs> I mean, he, in his glorified body, we know he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, during that time, which is now, my disciples shall fast. I, I had to repent. <laughs> I had been a Christian over 20 years. And I said, Lord, I've done many things, but I have I have not fasted hardly at all. And I had to change. And I found out really quick, good intentions don't count for squat. <laughs> I hope that's plain enough. The reason I mentioned the calendar, if you don't plan something, if you don't plan when you're going to fast. Well, I, I have good intentions, Gary. I'm, I, I'm going to fast more this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? And you don't plan it, you don't schedule it, you don't know what days. January will go by, February will go by. Pretty soon 2004 goes by. And you go, oh, excuse me, 2024 goes by. Wasn't I going to fast? <laughs> What's that saying again? Uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as change without change. <laughs> If you don't do something different, there's not going to be any change. You've got to, if you, so I want to fast more. You better schedule it. I'm telling you now, you better. If you're, if you're serious, if you good intentions probably won't happen. It's kind of like, oh yeah, you know, New Year's resolution. I'm going to, I'm going to lose all this weight and go to the gym. And that lasts through about January or first weekend of February. And then that's over. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go on. Then last week also, we talked about praying, and we talked about both kinds. Uh, where you, the first kind, where you pray with the understanding. So no matter what language you speak, of course, here I speak, well, English, but <laughs> Oklahoma English, okay. My known language. Well, I know, I know certain things to pray. I, uh, I, know, I know, you know, and we talked about praying for our government, which we're admonished to do, even the, even the politicians you don't like. And uh, we're admonished, though, to pray for our government. I know to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I know to pray. There's a lot of things where I do know what to pray because the Word tells me what to pray. But then there's a lot of situations where I don't really know what to pray. I don't, I don't know God's perfect will, you know. See, I'm thinking right now about the prodigal son. You remember that story? And again, I just have to follow him. I'm not going to ignore when he brings up things, so... 
remember the prodigal son and, and give me my inheritance and he left and he squandered basically his inheritance on the world. Well, but you know, a prodigal, a prodigal son. But then he ran out, he eventually came to the end of his, his uh, inheritance, came to the end of his money and he had to take a job, which you doesn't get much lower for a Jew boy <laughs> than feeding the pigs. But even then, he still, it, it, you know, he wasn't getting paid much, I guess, because it says he got so hungry, he was actually thinking about putting his face in the trough with the pigs. Now, does it get much lower? <laughs> See, at that moment, he, he might have been praying, uh, Lord, please, have send some money. So, have somebody give me some money. Uh, Lord, I don't want to have to put my face in the, in the trough with the pigs. He might have He might have been praying. Lord, I'm asking you, please, somebody, send somebody with some money for me. I don't know whether he's praying that or not. It's just a thought, you know. You know, the Bible plainly says, while he was in that situation, it says, and no man gave unto him. See, out in the margin, I wrote, thank God. <laughs> thank God. See, that wasn't God's will for him, that somebody would come. We call it today enabling and enable him to continue in his rebellion. You know? Thank God nobody gave to him. That's a prayer. God didn't answer that prayer the way he wanted it. Why? Because he needed to come to the end of him. He needed, as it said, he came to himself. He needs to come to himself. He needed to repent and return to his father's house. Glory to God. See, we, oftentimes we don't know what to pray as we ought. And that's, so we talked about praying with the understanding when you do know what to pray as you ought. But then there's times you really don't know what to pray as you ought. Well, thank God, we talked about this last week for the Holy Ghost. He always knows <laughs> what to pray. He has the wisdom of God. And he says, listen, soul, listen, Gary, you, Gary's mind who thinks you're Lord. <laughs> My, my soul still wants to be Lord so bad. It wants to be Lord, you know. <laughs> Make the decisions. I know what's right. <laughs> Shut up, soul. <laughs> Listen, Gary, soul, who so wants to be Lord. If you will humble yourself and re and admit, you don't always know what to pray, do you? <laughs> you don't always know what God's will is, do you? No, no I really don't. <laughs> if you'll humble yourself. The Holy says, Holy Spirit, that's it's your spirit praying. It says, when I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit, my spirit prayeth. Okay. But see, it's the Holy Spirit giving the utterance. He's the one that gives the syllables, that prayer language that he fully understands, and that the Father and Jesus fully understand. But he knows what to pray. It's your spirit doing the praying, and that's what releases the authority. One time, many times, people would ask Pastor Dave, can I just think in tongues and not pray? He said, it doesn't say he that thinketh in an unknown tongue. <laughs> no, no, the, the authority is released when you speak it, see. But the Holy Spirit is the one providing that prayer. He knows what to pray. And he will make intercession for the saints for you according to the will of God. It's a humbling it's humbling, first off, just to take time out of your busy day to pray in your known language because you're acknowledging, God, I'm very busy today. I've got so much to do. What I got to do is important, God. Do you understand me, God? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My stuff's important. I got things to do. <laughs> God, I don't know if God does eye rolls, you know. <laughs> I remember Martin Luther, and I may not quote this perfectly, but the principle is correct. He said something like this. He said, I have so much to do every day. I have no choice but to spend the first two hours in prayer. <laughs> that was Martin Luther. Dear Lord. You know, this man, oh, he did amazing things. But he says, I've got so much to do. I have no choice. I have to spend the first two hours in prayer because he needed God's help. He needed God to do what Martin Luther could not do. And you need God to do what you cannot do. And you need God to pray what you don't know you even need to pray. But the Holy Spirit, he won't waste your time. And if you'll allow him, 
it's a humbling thing. You're humbling your soul, first off, to even pray in, in your known language. But it's even, I think, a deeper humbling to come before the Lord. And, and really, you're admitting, I don't know what to pray, really. See, it's not just the path of God that you're praying. You're also praying about your infirmities. You know, he says the Holy Spirit, as Romans 8, 26, I believe, says he also, also helps us with our infirmities. Well, what's that? Well, those infirmities, Dave would say, those are the very things that's keeping you or keeping God from being able to manifest fully his power through you. It's keeping you from God's best. And a lot of times we would describe those as character flaws. Could just be false doctrine. I had false doctrine in me when it come to poverty. Pounded into me all those years that I grew up in a denominational church. They would just laugh, and but they were serious as a box of rocks. I'm telling you, they would say, Oh, we're praying for our pastor, Lord. Lord, you keep him humble, Lord, and we'll keep him poor, you know. And, and they were only, ha, ha, ha. They were only half laughing about that. <laughs> so anyway, I had strong, so it can be character flaws. You know, why do, I, why do I keep doing that same thing that I hate? Why do I keep doing that? You don't even know why you keep doing it. God does. <laughs> He'll help you. Oh, if you haven't read Dave's book, <laughs> The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power. It's available at his website in digital format. You can be reading it within the hour. You don't have, and you can get a hard copy, I guess, if you want to. You can write or call and ask. By the way, the prayer center uh, phone number has not changed. It's still 918-298-PRAY or 7729. And you can call and ask for a copy of Dave's book. It, 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 there's no charge for it. It's sent to you for free. I highly recommend that you make a donation, you outfit. <laughs> if you're going to, you don't have to. I mean, they'll give it to you free, but it's it's not free to them. The postage isn't free either. But anyway, you can get, there's a digital download at Dave's, daveroberson.org. Just go to books, I think it is. Might be media and then books, but books. And there it is. And in, in several different languages. Okay, let me get back to this. All right, so we've already talked about this, and I've, man, I thought I was going to have a quick review, and we're 27 minutes into the lesson here. So we talked about humble yourself by believing the word. Humble yourself through fasting. Humble yourself by praying in your known language. Spend time on purpose praying. Humble yourself by praying in an unknown tongue. Before I leave the unknown tongue, okay, one other thing. How are we going to get to Jesus meetings? See, if there was any place on earth where they were regularly, and I mean every time, every service, no matter who you brought to that meeting, no matter what condition they were in, blind, lame, deaf, mute, demon-possessed, I don't care what it is, no matter what it is, when you, you know, if there was anywhere on earth where this was happening and that you knew that if you brought them to that meeting, a Jesus meeting, you're bringing them home healed, well, free of devils, delivered, all the sentences you can think of. If there was any place like that on earth operating that way, and I don't mean sporadically, like once in a while. See, that's the gifts operating. What we do have today is gifts, and you they might get healed, they might not get healed. But that's not how Jesus did his. He, they were all healed, all of them. And so if there was anywhere on earth that was already operating in that, I would, listen, I would humble myself. Are you kidding uh, I'd be there. I don't care what it cost. I'd I'd be, I'd enroll. I'd be there. I'm a good student, man. And and I would I would submit myself there because if they're walking in it, perhaps they can teach me how to walk in it. But see, there's nobody like that. There is no university. There is no church. There is no ministry that I know of that today is operating that way. There's many of them operating in the gifts. We operate in the gifts. I mean, thank God for the gifts. Okay. But that's not a that's not the Jesus type meeting that he's called us to. He's called us to these revivals. I want to be believed. And he says, The works that I do shall you do also. Well, he healed them all. And he healed them all every time. So <laughs> read it for yourself. So what do we do? If there's no university, there is no ministry, there is no church where I can go and be taught, where can I go? Is there a teacher? Is there a teacher that can teach me, can take me right where I am and get me there? Yes, there is. 
I will send to you the spirit of truth. And he, personal pronoun, he, he will guide you into all truth. You got to humble yourself. Yes, sir. I had to humble myself to get an engineering degree. I, I did not know how to be an engineer, did not know. Yeah, trust me, but before I started uh, my uh, university days to learn how to be an engineer, you would not want to have driven over a bridge that I designed and built. <laughs> Why? Well, because I didn't know metallurgy. I did not know uh, kinetics and and I did not know the math required and the physics and the law, you know, all of the things required to design a bridge that's safe for people to drive over. So I want to be an engineer. Okay, good. That's good, Gary. How are you going to get there? Well, I got, I'm going to have to humble myself. I got to humble myself under the people that know how to do engineering. They're going to give me books and they're going to give me a, going to give me teachers and my job is to humble myself, attend the classes, learn what I have to learn in order for me to be, to function, as I say, as an engineer and produce bridges that won't kill people <laughs> or whatever engineering you do. Okay. Can you see it's not any different? God has given us the books. How many books are in the Bible? There, he has given us the teacher. We now there's teachers in the body. I'm teaching right now, but I am not the teacher. Come on. He has given us the teacher and he's given us an assignment. In the same way, I did not know how to do engineering. The whole church does not know how to do Jesus meetings, do we? Not, not the way I'm describing it, where they get healed first time, every time, no exceptions. And I mean, every time, <laughs> but that's the way Jesus meetings are. We don't know how to get there. Well, we have to attend a university. <laughs> We had the books, and I'm putting my hand on my Bible here. We had the books, 66 books, and we had the teacher. And he says, if over and over in our blueprint prophecies, and I hope you know what I'm talking about there, if you you can go to bronkflint.org on the homepage, not too far down, the blueprint prophecies. And there's been many more since then, but that that first batch that is our blueprint. And if you were going to boil it down into a sentence, all of those prophecies, let's say it this way, instructions from the teacher, how to go from where we are to walking in Jesus meetings, how to go from where we are into a full-blown revival like he's talking. If you're going to boil all of those prophecies down into like one, one sentence, it would be, come away with me, my beloved. We're going to have to spend time in the Word. We've got to spend time in worship. We've got to spend time praying in other tongues. We've got to spend time in fasting. He, we could, It's university time. It's really no different. In the same way, I, I had to humble myself and yield myself over to those who knew how to take a person from where they are to becoming an engineer and able to function as an engineer. The Holy Spirit is telling us, if you'll humble yourself, if you'll humble yourself, spend the time with me, let's say in university, <laughs> Holy Ghost University, whatever you want to call it, I will take you right from where you are. With all your messes, all your infirmities, all your weaknesses, I will take you from where you are, or you're in lack of understanding. Like, I, I didn't know how to, how to design a bridge. I will take you from where you are to functioning. The way Jesus said you're to function, the works that he did, you shall do also. <laughs> who, else, who else are you going to turn to besides the Holy Ghost? What other teacher do we have? There is nobody can take us there because there's nowhere on earth that's operating in it. So we only have one teacher, and that's the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, if you will come and away with me and spend the time with me in intimacy, you will walk there. And if, if words mean anything, if you don't, you won't. Just like the church hasn't hardly ever since the first century. And the book of Acts is what I'm talking about. Oh, my goodness. 
Well, we're over halfway through the lesson here. Let's talk about the next two because they really go together. Number four and five on that list. Humble yourself by listening and humble yourself by obeying. I didn't major on this when I was when he was having me uh, teach one of the lessons. One, my favorite lesson from the articles that we were teaching for the last few months uh, is is the one. It's got a strange title, but it's called "Does He Thank That Servant?" <laughs> Does he thank that servant? Which he's teaching about. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to become the servant. You got to become a first class servant that always puts the needs of the master first. And even after you've come in from doing your job that day, or whether, you know, he says, like, you know, milking cows or planting corn, whatever it is that the master has you do. And even after you finish your day's work, you first check on the master. Is there anything else you need? Before you go eat your, your meal, you check with the master. Do you, 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 that's a first class servant. And you're not doing it for hire, you're not doing it for personal profit. Your attitude, this is what I do. This is my duty. Is I'm, I'm a first-class servant. Well, that's the heart that you have to have, okay? But in the course of that, he says, does he thank that servant? You know, and I always thought that was a little rude because he says, nope, I trow not, meaning definitely not. And, and I always thought, man, you, you know, here's you don't even get the guy an attaboy, you know? I didn't really understand it. And one day, oh, now I'm leading to something on listening and obeying, okay? Listening and obeying. One day he asked me the question. He said, when was the last time you thanked your hand for obeying your mind? <laughs> and your attitude is like mine. is like, I, I, I don't thank my hand for obeying my mind. I mean, my hand, it started hitting me. My hand is just part of me. <laughs> we are one. And I started understanding, good Lord, that's how he sees us. We are one with him. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. It's not kidding. <laughs> and then I, I did this on one of those lessons. And I, if you're listening by MP3, let me describe. I'm just taking my fingers. I'm holding my hand up where you can see it. And I'm just moving my fingers like crazy. Boy, I mean, fast, go, go. Not bad for 77. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Look at these fingers. Look at all this stuff. I just got them going like crazy, you know. I didn't major on this because I didn't understand it. And I still am learning about this. But after I taught that lesson and I said, you know, look at, look, look at how my fingers are receiving instructions so quick from my mind. They're not thinking about it. They're not hesitating. They are doing exactly what my mind is commanding. After that, after that service, the Holy Spirit said to me, now you do know that your hand is not receiving language from your mind. <laughs> my my hand is not sitting there waiting. All right, tell me when to move this finger. S send me an email, and I'll move. I'll move these other things. You know, <laughs> thumb. When do you want the thumb to move? I'm waiting. I'm, you know. <laughs> See that communication is really faster than thought. I'm not even thinking that fast. It's happening quicker. Or maybe it's a speed of thought. I don't I don't know. But it's not language. And I didn't really understand the importance of it when he said it, and I didn't know how to talk about it much. But I've had some a few months now to meditate on that. See the the common thing is Gary, I just can't hear God. And if you're a Christian, that's just not true. I'm sorry, it's just not true. Because you have a conscience. See, your your conscience is instant. But it's not language, is it? You know, you get, you're going to just have a thought about stealing something. You know, I'm, I'm going to steal that. They, they left their whatever on the desk. I'm just, I'm just going to steal that. You just have a thought like that. And I mean, your conscience immediately kicks in. You don't hear language like Charlton Heston's voice from the Ten Commandments. You don't hear, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> No, that conscience, though, man, I mean instantly, like this fist, <laughs> that quick, instantly, without language, whoop, it communicates with you, but
but it's not language, but boy, is it clear as a bell. You can't steal that. And that same thing is going on with your, with if you're tempted to lie, uh, you you know, so many things, you know how your conscience works and it's not language. It's quicker, it's faster, it's more instant than language. I'm still learning more about this and I'm going to learn more about it. But this language, this communication that we have between the Holy Spirit Really, it's between Jesus and you, and now it's done by the agency of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, there is language involved, especially if it's like a tongue and an interpretation or a prophecy. But you individually walking, you're hearing from him a way lot more, way lot more, a whole lot more than you're given, maybe thinking about him. It has a lot to in the because. In the same way that he communicates through your conscience, he also gives direction. That's why Dave would say, as you, especially if you give a lot of time to praying in other tongues, the understanding of his direction, his calling is coming to you, even though you don't really realize it, because it's growing in you like a tree. Now, there's a lot of reasons why Pastor Dave used that uh, analogy of a tree, one day I got an instruction, I think, from the Holy... Anyway, this thought came to me. I was over at my mom's house that day, and she has this giant sycamore tree in her backyard. I mean, that rascal. You'll fall over backwards trying to look up and see the top of it. I don't know how tall it... Uh, you know, her house, of course, is a one-story house with a typical peaked roof, so I guess up to there it's two-story if you went that high. Well, that thing towers. That's probably <laughs> 10 stories tall, maybe. I mean, it's way up there. And... He went out and he said, take a, take a lawn chair and sit there and you're going to watch the tree grow today. <laughs> Think about eight hours. Hey, we're going to have an exciting day. What are we going to do today? Uh, we're going to go watch the tree grow. And it could be a sapling. It could be a small tree. You know, the, what are you going to spend your day doing? We are going to watch the tree grow Oh boy, exciting. Because Dave said, this is the way his ministry, his calling grows in you. It's like a tree. So you take a lawn chair and you bring your coffee or your lemonade or whatever it is, and you're going to sit there. You bring your sunglasses, a hat. You know, what are you going to do today? I'm going to watch the tree grow. You ready? Here we go. <laughs> One hour goes by. Oh dear Lord, one hour dear. God, I committed I committed to four hours today watching this tree grow. Oh two hours go by. Can you tell any change? No, I can't tell any change. Three hours go by. <laughs> what happened? Nothing. As far as I can tell. That tree is growing the whole time, isn't it? Even if it's a little sapling and it's when that sycamore was a little thing, maybe 10 foot tall, and, and was it growing? It was growing into this mighty tree. But if you sat there and tried to watch it while it's growing, you'd, you'd be bored to tears, but it's growing all the time and getting stronger and taller and thicker all the time. That is exactly the way the your, your understanding, your calling, your maturity. It's like watching children grow. I'm going to sit there and watch a child grow, you know, and you, you watch them play all day. Well, you, you know, on that day, it didn't look like they grew any, but boy, are they growing. See, at my age now, I'm so old now, my grandbabies are having babies now. <laughs> you know, how did this happen? My children are all in their 50s. I'm telling you, you better enjoy every day with your children. You turn around twice and they're 50 on you. <laughs> How, how did this happen? Well, it's the same way that, that the tree grows, you know. See, that's what praying in tongues or waiting on the Lord. Uh, but, you know, we're obviously not going to teach at length on waiting on the Lord today, but listening. He said, humble yourself by listening. Praying in other tongues. Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> praying in other tongues. There is no such thing as a wasted hour. 
praying in other tongues in the same way that there is not a wasted hour while that tree is growing. That tree is growing. And when you're yielding time to the Holy Spirit, and it's not just praying in tongues. When you're reading the Word, did you know this is your food? It, it, you know, his, his words are spirit. His words are life. The he, Jesus says you cannot can't separate him from the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and so forth. You cannot separate Jesus from the Word. You feed on the Word of God. You pray in other tongues. You meditate the way Dave says in whole images. You assimilate the Word. Spend time in worship and all of the things that we teach, fasting. That your tree is growing. Christ in you is coming to maturity. See, right now I'm thinking about the verse and I didn't look it up. He's not letting me look them up ahead of time. But in Galatians, Paul says, I'm in travail like a mother in birth, you know, like a pregnant woman. I'm in travail, in birth, again for you, that Christ be formed in you. See, the baby normally isn't delivered until it's formed. You know, there's a nine-month, roughly nine-month process where the baby is forming on the inside. Now, it's a human from the first cell division. DNA from the first cell division, that's an individual, unique human. But it's not ready for birth yet. See, Paul is praying for these Galatians. He wants them to be, wants Christ to be formed in them. So what is birth? Well, that's when what is on the inside is seen on the outside, when it comes from the inside to the outside. Christ, if you allow me, needs to be birthed in his church. That's revival, <laughs> where Christ is seen and the same works are seen because he's been allowed to mature, to form, to come to birth, revival really is a revealing, a coming forth from the inside to the outside of Christ. It's manifestation of Christ in the earth again. And it's in the same way that that baby every day for nine months is growing, forming, conforming <laughs> to the just image of a human. Every day that you spend doing the blueprint, let me just say the blueprint, read the blueprint again. Every day that you do the blueprint, there is a, a forming, a growth, a maturity, a growing like a tree. It doesn't seem like anything is happening. You go out there and spend eight hours watching that tree, it's agonizingly slow. You would put your hand on a Bible and say nothing happened. That tree grew during that eight hours. That tree grew. That Christ in you grows every hour that you give to the blueprint. And I mean the whole blueprint. Come away with me. The word, prayer, fasting, and worship. Waiting on God is what we're talking about now. See, and in that process, he's also working on your infirmities. This could be character flaws. It can be false doctrine. It can be the healing of old hurts and old wounds, you know. There's all all kinds of things that happen. But it's not going to happen if we don't do what he's called us to do, which is come away with me, spend time with him. I hear different ones talking about uh, that understand the serious, uh, seriousness of the hour that we're in. Not only It's not only America. It's worldwide. It's worldwide. Uh, this is such an important year. And I hear people making statements like, I'm going to leave it all on the field. And I think that's right. I think that's a, you know, like a football player, whether we win or lose, at the end of that game, I'm going to know I gave it my all. I left it all on the field. I think that's what he's calling us to this year. No matter what, no matter what, no matter no matter what, I'm I'm going to know that I left it all on the field. I'm preaching to myself as much as you. Hey, I like to relax, and you know I like I don't like fasting. I'll be honest with you. I, my soul would rather do a lot of things and spend the next several hours in prayer. Uh, 
my soul gets tired of reading the Bible. Doesn't yours? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't understand some. I mean, I can, really, on me, in my case, I can get pretty lost in the Bible. Like I say, I, like Dave used to say, I can pour me a hot cup of coffee. Take one sip. Ooh, it's hot. Set it down and open my Bible. And then the next sip that I take of my coffee, it's, how did that get so cold? <laughs> Man, you it, for me, it's easy to get lost in the Bible, but still, my soul gets tired of it. It's, it you know, it's, I want to go watch the EV. I want to go, let's go, let's go do something. You know, well, I'm tired of me with but I don't know what I mean. Listen, we all have things to do, and I know I'm not every, not everybody's at my stage of life. But, you know, many of you, you mamas, have got still got children in the house, and they got to be fed and clothed and diapers changed. And you men got to get up, go to work, you outfit and support your family. But he's not asking us to give him the time we don't have. <laughs> he's asking us to give him the time that we do have. Whew, there it is. When I started off, only time I had was the driving time in the trucks. Truckers only do three things, you know, when you're driving. You're either driving, you're eating, you know, like lunch or whatever, and during your break, or you're sleeping. Really hard to pray in tongues while you're eating. <laughs> Can't pray in tongues while you're sleeping. But I could give him the time that I did have. And that's the time while I'm driving. Because thank God, your soul is not really engaged. Your mind doesn't have to be engaged while you're praying in other tongues. If you don't understand that, you need to hear it. Dave Roberson, uh, daveroberson.org. And listen to those messages again about all those wonderful teachings about praying in other tongues. But that's the time that I did have. And I gave it to him. And then the rest is history, as they say. You give him what time you do have. You, part of what he's praying in there is your next schedule. <laughs> Who knows what that's going to be? Listening and obeying. Now listen, for years I coasted somewhat because uh, Pastor Tim uh, Stemple at the church who has been with Dave forever, really, uh, he would say, Partial obedience is disobedience. And I would I would say something really wonderful like, uh, yes, but partial obedience is better than no obedience at all. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. I lie. I, I wish I had never said that. <laughs> that was a stupid thing to say, a very immature thing to say. Uh, Saul, the first king of Israel, lost his anointing as king, which the whole church, I just tell you, the whole church has lost its anointing. But Saul, King Saul, he lost his anointing because of partial obedience. And uh, I, again, he didn't let me look it up. But, uh, he was supposed to wait. He had certain instructions what to do. One thing he was supposed to do was, in this one battle, kill everything that breathes. I mean, if it breathes, kill it like including the cattle and the sheep, you know. And he, the people didn't want him to do that, even though that, that was his instruction, kill everything that breathes, and he, he didn't do it because the people didn't want him to. In other words, he yielded to the, to the people, but he did partially obey. He, when they wiped out the, the army and everything, but, he said, but they kept, that it was partial obedience. They kept King Agag alive, and they kept the best of the cattle and the flocks and so forth. Partial obedience, see. And when the prophet shows up, Samuel, what what is this? What is this sound, this noise that I hear, this bleeding of sheep and mooing of cattle, you know? And so Saul basically said, oh, I obeyed the Lord, you know? We just kept the best of this because the people wanted me to. Partial obedience. Partial obedience. Before it was over, Samuel took the sword. He said, you bring that king. When they kept King Agag alive, they didn't kill him, and he's supposed to. So anyway, Samuel says, you bring him here. And Samuel took the sword, and he cut Agag into pieces. Partial obedience. I wish I'd have never said that. Eh, partial obedience is better than no obedience at all. I guess it is. But it, listen, you can, you can lose your anointing on it. I listened to Pastor Bronk teach last night, which I'm not going to get into it. Uh, today, but he taught a message last night on partial obedience where a prophet of God came, 
gave an accurate prophecy about a, uh, an altar and prophesied correctly, partially obeyed the instructions because he what God had told him, while you're in that land where I'm sending you to prophesy, don't eat anything there, don't drink anything there, and don't spend the night there. And so, you know, at first he was he was obeying God. He delivered the prophecy. The, the king offered him to come to his kingdom, his castle, I guess, his house. And uh, he's going to feed him and let him spend the lodge him there. And he said, nope, the Lord told me don't eat anything here, no bread, no water, and not, not to stay here. So I'm leaving. Okay, so he's leaving. But then a long story short, another uh, another prophet uh, basically got him to, let me just say, because we're running out of time. The other prophet lied to him. <laughs> a prophet that lies? Well, I'm just saying, read it for yourself. This other prophet lied to the first prophet and told him, no, 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 the Lord told me that you can come to my house and eat and drink. Well, he allowed him, he allowed him. The second, he, he, he believed it and he disobeyed the instruction of the Lord, went to that prophet's house, ate and drank and wound up a lion killed him before he could even get out of the country. A lion killed him. Saul lost his anointing through partial obedience. That prophet lost his life through partial obedience. Listening and obeying is humbling, humbling, humbling. When you hear the Lord, yes, sir, I'll close with this. In the early days, Sue and I received instructions that I had never heard any other ministry have. Uh, I'm not saying there, none of them heard, but at least none of the ministries that we were acquainted with at the time, and I don't mean personally, but even the ones on national TV, were, got those same instructions as us. And I'm not against appeal letters. I'm not against letting people know what you're doing. I'm not against letting people, uh, if they want to fi help financially, if you explain to them what God's called you to do. See, that's fine as long unless God tells you to otherwise. <laughs> I mean, I'm not against any of those things, and God has many people do that. I've counseled ministers to do that. But see, in our case, he told us in the very beginning, don't sell anything. <laughs> he says, don't even put in a return envelope when you send a thank you letter. Or, you know, I'm not against return envelopes or anything, but I'm just, all I know is what the Lord told us. And he says, you make everything free, send it postage paid, don't even, don't ever let another person know any of the needs you have, either yourself or the ministry. And he says, if you will precisely obey these instructions of mine, I will speak to the hearts of the people I choose to support you and the ministry. Not hard to understand, hard to obey, <laughs> especially those first few years where money was staying away in great abundance. And oh my goodness. Anyway, we actually received counsel from people that are still my friends today that I trust that are that are that were seasoned ministers been at it a long time a lot longer than us we actually received counsel that maybe we shouldn't do it exactly that way you know that maybe you know they they were concerned for us that we hadn't really heard God I understand that they were trying to help us but I thank God that we didn't listen to them <laughs> I thank God that we held fast to what he said. We're still doing it today. <laughs> if I have a need, you won't know about it. <laughs> if the ministry has a need, you won't know about it. Why? Because he told me. He told me how to do it. And, I, you know, we're, we're going to continue to do it just exactly the way he told us. And he's still here. It's been all these years later. That was way back in the late 90s. And here it is, 2024. And he's taken care of us all these years. Still taking care of us today. As you can tell, I... I haven't missed any meals, <laughs> well, except for fasting <laughs> on purpose, but I haven't missed any by necessity because he's provided for us. We, we li Again, we live in a nice home. It's dry and warm in here, thank God. I've got uh, two cars in the driveway. They're both used, but they both run. we got food in the refrigerator. You know, our life is good. God's taking good care of us. Partial obedience is disobedience. And, and thank God that he forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all of our diseases. His mercies are new every morning. I don't know any perfect people. I'm most certainly not perfect myself. I, but 
I'm pressing towards the mark of perfect obedience. And that's what we all need to do. Spend time listening. Humble yourself to get quiet and listen. Then humble yourself to obey what you hear. Love you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.